Carbon emissions are rapidly heating our planet. There's no doubt about it. In fact, the levels of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere are higher than they've been at any time in the past 400,000 years. Our addiction to fossil fuels has had catastrophic consequences. Water levels are rising. Shorelines and communities are crumbling. Entire ecosystems vanishing. But on a remote Nordic island at the edge of the Arctic Circle, scientists are innovating solutions that may just make our home planet more livable. What we are doing here is we are using power from a volcano to improve our future. When the scientists came to my table 15 years ago in the presidential residence, what they were describing was a, an utter nonsense, so, so to speak, if you compared it to the practical reality. Of course, a lot of my colleagues in the field of geology are looking at the consequences of climate change. So I'm the fortunate one actually contributing with something that might help us out of this miserable situation. Because of the scientific and political risks taken by this small island nation, in the next 50 years, CO2 may no longer be haunting our atmosphere. The story of geothermal, it goes back like 100 years here in Iceland. Before, we used to use the hot springs to wash our clothes, but today we build power plants and the power plants look like this. Iceland is one of the most geothermically active countries in the world. But it wasn't until the oil crisis in the 1970s that this once fossil fuel dependent nation started to capitalize on its powerful waterfalls and fiery volcanic activity beneath its feet. Today, almost 100% of its electricity comes from renewable resources, and a good chunk of it is geothermal. We are standing on the edges of an active volcano. This is where you have huge high temperature resources for geothermal production. The biggest difference here is that you have basically a natural source of steam that is coming from the ground. You don't have to burn fossil fuel for the energy to produce the steam on surface. You get it from the geothermal system. This geothermal plant is the largest in Iceland. It's also one of the largest in Europe producing more than 1,000 kilograms of hot water per second, which is transported via stainless steel pipes to the nation's capital. It does not mean that we have free energy, but we have cheaper energy, and the CO2 footprint from the energy here in Iceland is, is very small compared to fossil fuel energy, which is used in most places. Iceland can run for decades or even thousands of years on geothermal heat. The heat that is stored in the bedrock of Iceland is huge. Harnessing the power of the volcanic bedrock to naturally power the massive turbines that drive Iceland's power supply has helped this nation become a world leader in carbon neutrality. But it's a unique project that sits adjacent to the power plant that has the capacity to make a big dent in our global carbon surplus. Now we are at the capture plant where Carpix captures CO2 from unpowered geothermal plant that we have here behind us. In this tower, we have water streaming down the column, and we have on the bottom the gas stream moving upwards. And then, because of the solubility of the CO2, it gets dissolved in the water. So it's essentially just a soda stream machine, and we are making sparkling water, which is piped towards the injection well, where we inject it into the ground and turn it to stone. The carbonated water arrives here in this pipe. We actually inject it into this injection well. This well reaches about 2,000 meters into the ground, but the water is released to the bedrock at about 800 meters depth. And there it starts streaming through fractures and pores that are uh, present in the rocks. You can actually see it right here. They kind of look like a sponge. So this is basaltic rock. It's the most common rock type on surface on Earth. It can be found in all of the continents and most of the oceanic floor as well. It has a lot of cavities and fractures that the fluid can actually flow through. So just like sparkling water, this acidic fluid can 
easily release these metals. The CO2 combines with the metals and forms these carbonate minerals. So the voids get actually filled with this. You can see these white dots and this is just CO2 turned to stone, just locked within the basaltic bedrock. Rocks are already the biggest reservoir for carbon on Earth. And the idea of using their natural process to capture and store our excess carbon has been proposed by scientists since the 90s. What CarbFix have discovered is how to accelerate a natural process that normally takes thousands of years. So that was the key that we had to find. And what we do to accelerate this process is to dissolve the CO2 in water. So that was what we are doing in the SodaStream machine. And by dissolving the CO2, we are actually killing the buoyancy of the CO2. So it's not going to rise back to the surface. The CO2 charged water is actually heavier than the groundwater. So it has the tendency to sink rather than to rise up. So that adds to, to the security of the method. Here we are using fresh water, but we are also working on using seawater as well. If we are able to use seawater to dissolve the CO2 before we inject it, we can apply this method in areas where water is scarce and in coastal areas and of course offshore, because seawater is not as limited as fresh water. The reason why this technology has been demonstrated on such a large scale in Iceland is firstly, we have the renewable energy to drive our systems. So we are not emitting CO2 in the process of, of getting rid of the CO2. So that's quite important. And that's also why we are collaborating with companies like Climeworks that are doing direct air capture. And secondly, Iceland is the largest landmass above sea level on the mid-oceanic ridges. So it's 90% basalt. We have the perfect geological conditions here to do all the development that we need. CarbFix have proven that their method can be used on site next to major CO2 sources like power plants, directly capturing and sinking emissions before they even have a chance to make it into the atmosphere. But this method can happen without basalt, and not all geographies are blessed with this volcanic rock. This is where the concept of CO2 hubs comes in. Shipping terminals where lands rich in basalt can receive the world's CO2. One of these is being developed outside of Reykjavik, next to a Rio Tinto aluminum plant. The advantage of having the terminal here is that thanks to the aluminum smelter, there is an excellent hub. So you can already bring the vessels uh, from Europe or other countries. You also have the clean energy electricity grid that is strong enough to power a smelter and will be strong enough to power the terminal for, for, for the carpix. And you also have a region which is very rich in basalt and then you have the ocean that can bring the water that, through the technology that has been developed. So everything is here and the area here can take an enormous amount. So it, it would not matter even if a new ship came every 24 hours to this harbor, we would still be able to do it. I brought together Icelandic scientists, American scientists uh, at the presidential residence. We had uh, fascinating discussions about this possibility. And I said to them, if you succeed in the science, we can create what I call pumping stations all over the world, like was done over 100 years ago when oil and petroleum came along. We have now to create similar pumping stations with respect to taking the carbon from the atmosphere and sending it down to the basalt to turn it into stone. And the good news is, basalt is not just in Iceland. It is in America, it is in Russia, it is in India and many other places. And because CO2 goes all around the globe, it doesn't matter where we have the pumping stations, we can succeed. But Iceland is showing the way. If my small country can have such a fundamental contribution to the global climate battle, what will happen if the big corporations, the, uh, the G20 countries, the leading economic powers of the world, all come together in this campaign? So the challenge is not to not just to build one terminal here in this area. The challenge is to build hundreds and thousands of such terminals in the next 10, 10 to 20 years. I think geothermal can be a big player in improving life on Earth because this is an energy resource, it's a renewable resource, 
and it can reduce the CO2 emissions from power production and, and it can be a big player in, in, in improving our lives. If we manage to build up this method around the globe, we can contribute to carbon neutrality and then to even become carbon negative beyond 2050. So hopefully this method can be applied together with other solutions to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement.